came into Uyaku, um, there was lots of speculation on what we were doing there. And uh, the, uh, a, a day or two after we arrived uh, was Sunday, and at the end of the church service, when most people would be gathered, uh, I gave the first what would be dozens of explanations <laughs> of what we were there, translated on the spot by getting into people. Um, also met with the, um, the village councillors, with the elders, um, with uh, the Mother's Union, which is the main women's church group. Um, and when I did the village census, which was a wonderful thing to do, uh, I'd made up a list of questions, getting it, I translated them into my scene, then we'd work together so I could speak them. And we took that through the village over the course of a month or so. And this is a village of about 500 people. Uh, and you couldn't visit people, just ask questions. You would also have to chew betel nut, you'd have to have some food. Um, and so it was a great way of meeting people and also getting all sorts of other information. But also it's a case where people would keep on asking what we were there for. And we would explain what a researcher does in a book. Um, and um, I think some people got it. Other people were disappointed. There were a number of people who were hoping that we were going to bring in American business and that people were going to get rich. They regarded themselves as very, very poor at that time. We learned many years later that a few, some of the older people thought we might be returned ancestors who would do the same kind of good things for the community. Um, and there was some speculation that we might be Pentecostal missionaries, uh, which worried the uh, older folk because they had heard that in Pentecostal circles, uh, the young people get into it and they have big parties in the bush and then all the girls get pregnant. So we didn't realize this, but we were being serenaded the first few nights we were there by a, what's called a string band. This is a group of four boys with one not very well-tuned guitar. Um, two of the boys singing falsetto and the other boys singing um, kind of normal range uh, and playing for hours, serenading us. And, um, and sometimes this was gospel music since we realized later that they were kind of hopeful this was going to happen, but it didn't. And I think after time, people, people got used to us. Um, this was not long after Papua New Guinea had gotten its independence. So we were there in six years after the independence of the country. And older people had grown up with a colonial government, and their experience of white people had been patrol officers who they had to obey. So there was a, a very hierarchical kind of sense of things, too, that made us quite uncomfortable of the older people calling us Master and Mrs. We insisted on being called by our names. Um, but other people, you know, the more they saw us, the more that we saw we, we, eating with them, eating their food, sharing time with them, the more people kind of relaxed, the more they got used to us asking questions and working with us. Um, people differed in terms of their wanting to work with us, but, but uh, uh, most people were incredibly gracious. And over time, they started referring to us as their daughter, their son, using the, the local kinship terminology. I would gained some big brothers, I gained some young brothers. We set up our relationships in terms of reciprocity and our expectations. Um, I was adopted into a high-ranking clan. There's high-ranking clans, low-ranking clans, and I was given a betel nut tree, an areca palm tree. Um, they chew betel nut incessantly there, and so it was very important that when I walked around, I would have my, my bag with my, my betel nut and my lime stick and my lime pot uh, so I could sit with the men and I could give them betel nut because it was my job as a senior man to, senior clan man to be able to give. So I learned how, to, people helped us learn how to act normally <laughs> in terms of their system, you know, and they were very gracious about all the mistakes we made. So most of my research was focused on religious change initially, but it was impossible to ignore the fact that the women had these elaborately tattooed faces. And uh, it was impossible to ignore the fact that they made this beautiful, beautiful tapa cloth, which was one of the major ways that they would make money. They were far from any kinds of roads or places they could sell tapa, but the church would buy it from them in Wanagala and then ship it out, and it would be sold in art, art stores in Port Moresby and elsewhere to tourists and expatriates. But it was also the case throughout this area, people in the past had worn tapa cloth for as their normal clothing, and they still wore it for ceremonial occasions, so they still needed it. 
uh, but they weren't making it so much anymore. So the Mycene produced a lot of tapa that had um, designs that were what they would call uh, normal designs that had no significance. They have special designs that are clan designs that have to be worn by particular people. And these ones, there was an internal New Guinea market for those, and there still is. So we got very interested in the tapa cloth as well, because it's just, it's just uh, beautiful. May I show you some? So this is, this is a woman's skirt. Okay, and this is a wraparound skirt. Um, and they have sold these around the world for wall hangings. And much of my research, uh, not in this initial trip, but when I came back in 1986, focused on tapa cloth and on tattooing, which was dying out at that point, on women's art and so forth. Things that had very little to do about, with Christianity, although the women were making, the most gifted tapa cloth makers were making top of cloth to decorate the altar in the church, the walls, and they were making vestments for the priests. And uh, the mission, the church, celebrated its 100th anniversary a few years later, and the, the Archbishop of Canterbury came, and he was given a Mycene vestment to take back. So it, like everything else, it all kind of ties in together. So this was a very, very rich, rich experience as one's first field work tends to be, and I could talk about all sorts of other things like being put into a film called Anthropology on Trial, uh, where fortunately I came out looking relatively good. It could have gone the other way, but that was very nerve-wracking to know that I was going to be on American television right around the time I was defending my dissertation and having no control over being filmed. Um, but anyways, that's, there's so much one could talk about. Um, I continued to uh, be interested in Christianity. I finished my PhD here at UBC in, in 1984 and graduated in the next spring. Um, was fortunate to get a postdoc to go to the University of Washington and um, because it was uh, uh, a postdoc had to come up with a new project, I decided at that point I was going to study uh, Christians in Northwest Coast communities since we were going to be in this area. Uh, and so uh, was fortunate enough to get a, a, a two-year postdoc down at the University of Washington, which has a, a great tradition for studying the Northwest Coast, and um, worked with Carol Eastman, who was a, a much-loved and much-missed uh, linguist who had worked in this area, uh, but continued to be interested in Papua New Guinea as well. And while, uh, and Anne also took a postdoc down there uh, to learn, uh, tr be trained as a clinical psychologist. And while we were there, we had an association with the Burke Museum, uh, which has a great Northwest Coast collection and so forth. And I did a lot of archival work on missionaries in the Northwest Coast uh, in that area. Um, and I, but I didn't, you know, kept on publishing, started publishing on my Mycene work and one of the things I really wanted to do was to, um, to to write about religious change and I was being invited to write things on other subjects but not very much about Christianity. So I organized a session at the Association for Social Anthropology, the same group that had done Mission Church and Sect about 10 years earlier, um, and made it very clear it was going to be on Christians and brought together a really amazing group of mostly very young scholars at that time, um, and, and some senior scholars too. So it was a really kind of mixed group, including Ann Chowning, who had been my master's uh, supervisor. And, uh, and out of that uh, came this book, which was my, my first major publication. And uh, it's an edited book, um, but in this book, particularly in the introduction, I, I wrote about the importance of getting away from thinking about Christianity only in terms of Western missionaries. So, among other things, they said, first of all, most missionaries weren't Western, something I mentioned before. They were Pacific Islanders, and so the kind of Christianity they were passing on had already been transformed in many ways, and that this is certainly interesting to study. And secondly, uh, this was at the point where what's called the historical turn in anthropology was coming in that 
uh, it's very important to understand that when we encounter what looks to be indigenous religions in these places, that they have been greatly influenced by uh, interaction with, with Christians. Uh, again, not just Western Christians, but with local Christians as well. And so I, I could have realized, you know, after I did my research, that I could have written a, a book, uh, you know, lots of articles on traditional Mycene religion or traditional Mycene culture, and it'd be very actually misleading. It looked traditional, but these guys had been Christian overwhelmingly for 40 years. And um, you know, everybody had been baptized. Everybody has a Christian name as well as a Papua name, things of that nature. And so it was, in a way, I realized that what was happening was that anthropologists writing about Melanesian religion were editing out um, the whole Christian part. And when they brought it in at all, they talked about it as missionaries. So that led me to start doing some comparative research uh, to take a look at uh, take a look at, at the how anthropologists have been writing about religious change in New Guinea, and and that's a facet of my work that I've been doing ever since. But I, I wrote a, a, a critique of this uh, quite early on, and this is a, was an essay in a in a book, but it's it, it gets read quite a bit. Um, but basically, the first part is a critique of of how anthrop how anthropologists have edited out Christianity. Um, and I, I wanted to expand that also to write about how missionaries have edited out Christianity because they do it as well in interesting ways. Um, and that part of that essay gets cited a lot, you know, so I'm, that's quite nice. The second part of the essay almost never gets cited, which was, here's what we need to do about it. And what I suggested we needed to do about it was to try to take a look at religious change from different kinds of perspectives, from a local, roughly saying, a local perspective, a regional perspective, and a global perspective. And it looks very different. A world religion looks very different when you come at it from these different kinds of ways. And I would say that much of my, my work on Christianity has been trying to understand things in, in those, those kinds of terms. terms. So, um, so I got to go back to New Guinea for two months in 1986 with the National Geographic grant. I was an expedition, because <laughs> that's what they call you if you get a grant from them. Um, uh, they didn't like any of my photographs when I came back, so I never got into the magazine, but it was nice to be an expedition. Um, the Burke Museum uh, gave me money to do a, a collection of tapa cloth, and so a systematic collection, and so I did. Um, and when we came back, we put up a little exhibit of tapa cloth at the Burke Museum, um, and uh, which was a lot of fun. And part of what we did with that was to indicate that this is not a uh, surviving tradition, but this is a changing tradition and so forth. Now we take this for granted, but this still was a pretty, in the mid-'80s even, it was still a pretty novel idea. And we could also show T-shirts with tapa designs and uh, other kinds of things that people elsewhere, not Mycene, were doing with Mycene designs, which in a few years later would be seen as, as cultural appropriation, but at that time was not. So all of that became part of that, that visual display that we worked on at that time. So another thing that happened at that time, which is um, and it, totally unrelated, so I'm going to talk about it anyways. But when I was an undergraduate student in fourth year, they had a full year course in the history of anthropology. And this is in the, the late 70s, mid to late 70s. And we were to choose one anthropologist to do a biography for, on, on for our final paper, kind of intellectual biography. And everybody chose, you know, the, the big names, you know, Malinowski, Leach, whatever. And I wanted to do a Canadian. It was kind of the height of Canadian nationalism. Everybody who worked in the department where I was was an American. Uh, and it just seemed to me I wanted to do, you know, a, a Canadian. So uh, I asked for suggestions, got blank faces. And eventually, um, Carol Farber, who ran this class, said, well, why don't you do T.F. McElwraith? And T.F. McElwraith is a, a guy who worked up at a place called Bella Coola in, in in uh, British Columbia. So uh, wrote one book, but it was a big book. Um, and so I thought, okay, uh, I'll do that. And I tried to learn something about this guy and 
couldn't learn anything from my own uh, department at that time until someone came up with the bright idea to say, well, why don't you look up his obituary? Which is now when I taught history of anthropology, I always say to my students, start with the obituary. Uh, and it's at that point I learned that he had been, uh, he had founded the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto and had run it for nearly 40 years, 120 miles up the 401 from London, and nobody in my department knew this. You know, just amazing. There was no knowledge of Canadian anthropology. Uh, outside of a handful of people at this point. There were a few, but, not that, but nobody at Western Ontario. So um, I became very interested in that and his life, and uh, then I went to Toronto. I met his widow. He had died in, in 1963, but his widow was still alive, um, you know, about 15 years later. And this was one of these magical moments. She, she took me down to her basement, and she said, well, when, when uh, Tom died, he left all this stuff, and there were cartons. And in the cartons were all these letters and his field documents and, you know, a historical treasure trove. So I was able to use those to make my paper, um, among other things. Um, I learned a, a fair amount through McElwraith about uh, the New Hope people and Bella Coola. Um, and I also learned this fascinating story that he had written the Bellacoola Indians, is this two big, two volume work um, in 1925, but was not able to publish it until after the Second World War because the National Museum in Ottawa considered it to be obscene. And so, because it had sex and things like that in it, so they refused to publish it. And it was only after uh, research organizations who set after the war with, with money. And he ran one of them, that he was able to get money to actually get it published. So later on, I was very interested in, in pursuing this, because, in part because the letters were so wonderful. You know, he sent letters back from Bella Coola, which is a little community about 400 kilometers north of Vancouver, a little fishing community. And he sent letters back to his, his father um, about his experiences there, very detailed letters. And in the course of his two stints doing field work there, his mother had died. And so that had delayed his return for the second stint. And um, so unusually for an anthropologist, instead of being there just in the summer, which is when anthropologists did their research, he was actually there during the winter. And that's where the winter ceremonial was going on. So it turns out he's the only anthropologist who actually participated in a winter ceremonial that I'm aware of. And he participated in as, as somebody who recorded the songs, which they created on the spot. And then he would be the prompter who would prompt out the songs. And he danced and things like this. And he writes all about this in his letters, but only a little bit about it in his book. Because he was doing uh, what was considered to be the right kind of anthropology then, where you write about the traditional society. And because these dances were occurring in a school gym with lights, and uh, weren't perfectly performed anymore and things like that. He, he just wrote about them in his letters. And he actually apologized to Sapir and to others back in Ottawa for wasting so much time engaged in these winter ceremonials. So, you know, this was amazing <laughs> to me. And the letters are just wonderful and they're very funny. And they're, they're, he obviously loved the people and, um, and they got along quite famously, and they were really happy to have some, a white person there actually was interested in their culture. And who, uh, this is time of the potlatch suppression laws as well. So in some of his letters, he, he writes back to his father jokingly, you know, I could be arrested any minute, which actually was true. So, you know, interesting guy. Um, so uh, with, with uh, um, Doug Cole from the University of, from Simon Fraser University, he and I put together these letters, uh, some of them, um, tried to get them published, didn't really succeed earlier on. This is back when I was in New Zealand. But when I got back to uh, North America, I, I went back to work on them. Uh, I went to Ottawa and other places, discovered other letters. The family uh, found even more letters that they sent to me. Uh, and then after I got my job here at UBC in 1987, um, I decided that this should be a priority uh, to see if if we could do something about getting these letters published. But it's funny, I thought I needed to have a copy of the Bellicola Indians at that point. So I went to a used bookstore, and they wanted $800 for it. And I learned then that there had only been one print made of this 
this book, maybe 500 copies in total. I went to the UBC library. Uh, there were two copies of the two volumes. A lot of them had photocopied pages that had been inserted because it's been so damaged. I went up to, uh, at that point, I started writing to the University of Toronto Press about getting it reissued. And, um, and they said, well, we only do it if there's people who will buy it. So I also wrote to the band office in Bella Coola, and I wrote to anth various anthropologists who had worked on the Northwest Coast to get them to send support letters. And what really nailed it for me was going up to Bella Coola, meeting with the elders, being in a room where the last survivors speaking, uh, could speak New Hulk, talked about it in their language, which was amazing. Um, and I also learned there that they had one copy and they kept it in the band safe because it was so precious. And they had just, at that point, built their own school. They were teaching traditional dances again. They were getting the young people involved in carving again. And they basically regarded this. This was known as the Bella Coola Bible. And most of the Bella Coola Indians is actually made up of oral traditions that Malcolm Wraith had recorded and so forth. So University of Toronto Press agreed to republish it, bless their heart. Um, the next year before it came out, we went up with the surviving McElwraith family, including uh, Tommy McElwraith, who was a geographer at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and he looked just like his father. And they dressed him up with a cedar collar. They had him dance. They took a picture of him that matches the picture taken of his father when he was dancing this thing. And they gave him his father's New Hulk name. And we uh, engaged in our very first potlatch with this wonderful traditional dancing and things like that. So it was a magical experience. And then the next year, the book came out. So this is the volume one. And the second volume is just as thick. Okay. And most of this is uh, made up of oral traditions by the New Hulk people um, that Malcolm Wraith recorded. Uh, mostly as a stenographer. And they're all in English. They're not in New Hulk. He couldn't speak New Hulk. He, he recorded them using a, a, a kind of trade language called Chinook um, there. So one of the things I asked the, the, the New Hulk when, when I first went up is that, do you want the book just as it is, or do you want it to be, you know, look at his field notes and translate it properly or whatever? And they said, don't change a word. He's the one who heard it from our ancestors. These are our ancestors' words. And so when they called the New Hulk Bible, they're talking about their ancestors who are in this book. And I met many of those people, you know, who, who are named in the letters. The, the, the names Schooner, Moody, and so forth are common names in that community. And these are all people whose grandparents had worked with McElwraith. Um, so that was, that was kind of magical. And I, I wrote a new introduction for this, talking about the, the suppression of this book and so forth. But the most important thing I talked about was kind of the, the importance of anthropological work. So this is coming out of a period where anthropology is in crisis. We're going through the debates about, um, uh, about appropriation, about um, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, um, The James Clifford books have just come out. George Marcus stuff has just come out about experimental writing and, and so forth and about just, this is how this is mostly just literature and, and so forth. And this is a good example of how it is literature, of course, because it's very much a translation. But the thing is, if, if this young Canadian, he was only 25 when he went up there, had a, a BA from Cambridge, so not greatly trained, but if he hadn't gone up there and done this, and if he hadn't persevered with the Ottawa bureaucracy to get it published, this would have been lost. And that's pretty darn amazing. So when anthropologists are being knocked for cultural appropriation and so forth, you know, back in my mind, I kind of say, well, we should wait another half century or so, you know, and see what people make of the stuff that comes back to them, um, because this, this is really important. At the potlatch there with the McElwraith clan and, and all the New Hulk dancers and so forth, um, there was also a number of people from Bella Bella. They were celebrating a, a memorial. This was a memorial potlatch for people who died in Bella Bella and Bella Coola. And at one point, the, the senior chief in the Bella Coola, New Hulk people, said, uh, we had our historian. They didn't call him an anthropologist. We had our historian. His name was a young man called McElwraith. 
And the Bella Bella chief got up and said, well, we had our historian. His name was Boaz. <laughs> I just thought, as an anthropologist, this is, this is a magical moment. I wish I could record this. Um, so it was amazing being there. And it was also just amazing for the kind of historical depth. Um, and uh, it's really brought home to me how close social, cultural anthropology and history really are. And so much of my work has been it's as historical as it has been has been cultural. But with all of my students, I always say, you know, you got to go for the depth. You got to go for understanding that that people have a lot of experience that that filters through into the present and shapes their world. So that's an important way. And that what we write, and what we put into films or any other form can and often will come back in very, very surprising ways.